Hello and welcome to the Understanding the Economic Impact and Labor Force Reentry Report webcast. We have just a few announcements before we begin. The slides will advance automatically throughout the presentation. To enlarge the slides, click the Enlarge Slides button located above your slide window. Should you need technical assistance, click on the Help button. If your screen freezes or the slides do not appear to be advancing as they should, please try exiting and restarting the session as it may be an issue with your connectivity. At any time, you can ask a question using the box on the left-hand side of your screen. I would now like to turn the call over to Jen McNeil so that we can begin. Thanks so much, Russ. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon for today's webinar. I would like to welcome Janet Dunbrack, who will be our presenter this afternoon. Janet is a health policy consultant who also wrote this Economic Impact and Labor Force Reentry Report. We would encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. Jan, Janet, I'll now turn the presentation over to you. Thank you very much, Jan, and welcome, everybody. I'm so glad you could join us today. I want to start by giving you an overview of what today's presentation will be. First of all, we'll talk a little a bit about why the report was created, how it was developed, the research that went into it, who provided the information, and then we'll talk about the financial impact of breast cancer and then the issue of labor force reentry, going back to work. Following that, we'll look at the health and psychosocial impact of the financial burden. In other words, the, the um, way that financial burden can impact your health and create stress. Uh, secondly, we're going to look at how aware are the public of these issues, because that influences the context in which uh, advocacy can be done. We'll follow that with the CBCN action plan, which resulted from uh, this research, and then wrap up and then turn over to your questions and comments. So we'll start by talking about why this report was written. CBCN has become aware over the years that breast cancer is not just a health issue, it's also an economic issue. Five years ago, or six years ago now, CBCN surveyed women on the economic impact of breast cancer, and what they discovered was that they're very high out-of-pocket costs that are not covered by Medicare, and that many women and their families went into debt or went without treatment because they just couldn't afford it. What CBCN realized was that nothing has changed since 2004. It was time for a five-year update and to develop an action plan to come to terms with this because uh, nothing much seems to be happening. In addition, CBCN recognized that going back to work was an important issue for women. That emerged from the 2004 survey and also for com from conversations over the years that CBCN has had with women. The support for doing this report was provided by the Breast Cancer Society of Canada, and the report was created to address all of these issues. So what kind of research went into this report? Polara, which is a large Canadian polling firm, conducted an online survey during the winter of 2009 and invited women aged 18 and over who'd had a breast cancer diagnosis within the past five years, um, mainly because they were trying to get at people who had been in the workforce or were likely to uh, have been in the workforce. The survey consisted of multiple choice and written comments, so it was both a quantitative and a qualitative survey. In addition to that, Polara did a big general population survey of over 3,000 Canadians to measure their awareness of these issues. CBCN then hired someone to analyze all the Polara data and the written comments and to write the report, and that's me. And the report was launched publicly in May of this year. So who provided the information on these surveys? There was a large response to the call for participation uh, almost 450 people responded to the survey, and many of them provided written comments that told the human story behind the statistics. And there were, I would say, literally thousands of written comments. 
98% of the respondents were women. There were a few men. Men can get breast cancer, although it's a tiny percentage of the total. 90% of the women who answered the survey were of what we would consider usual working age, between 18 and 64 years old. And close to half of the people who responded were age 45 to 54, which is really prime working years. The next largest group were those aged 35 to 44. Again, people really uh, at the high point of their career and involved in the workforce. Only 3% of people who answered were older than 65. And when did people get their breast cancer diagnosis? Well, almost half of them received it when they were aged between 45 and 54. So again, when they were probably involved uh, in the workforce and probably had people at home, children to take care of or putting uh, children through university and so on. In other words, probably also the sandwich generation, a lot of, uh, a lot of life stresses, a lot of uh, expenses. I'll tell you a little bit more about the profile of um, people who responded. Um, we had more responses from Ontario than any other province, followed by a lot from Quebec, BC, and Nova Scotia. And all the other provinces and territories were represented except for the Northwest Territories in Nunavut. Most of the respondents were uh, English speaking, 84%, uh, and the remainder were had French as a first language. The, survey was offered in both languages and it was interpreted uh, in the original language. Uh, a high percentage of women who answered had college diplomas or university degrees and most in terms of treatment had had surgery and about 75 percent had additional treatments as well. Now here's an important fact coming up to keep in mind and we'll talk about this later as well. The average time women spent in treatment was 38 weeks. The employment insurance sickness benefits last for a maximum of 15 weeks, so you can see there's a gap, and this turned out to be a big important issue and one that recurred for a lot of women. So how much does treatment cost women and their families? Well, Medicare pays for in-hospital costs, physician costs, and in-hospital drugs. But a lot of people expressed shock and surprise when they discovered that most costs incurred outside the hospital are not covered by Medicare, especially in some provinces. So your drugs, medical supplies, and prosthetics are often out-of-pocket costs. Some of the costs may be partly covered by public health plans, but not always. Uh, and out-of-hospital chemo, which is a growing trend, is often an out-of-pocket cost as well. If you have private insurance, it may pay for some of these costs, but a lot of women don't have private insurance. And the provincial formularies, which are the drugs that are approved by provinces and territories, which are offered under drug plans at low cost or no cost, vary tremendously from one province to the other. So you may have a drug covered in one province, and the very same drug may not be covered in another province. So there's a great variety across Canada. Uh, some people get access to drugs, particularly new drugs, through compassionate access. And one thing that wasn't looked at but can be a substantial cost is the cost of home care, if you need that. It's not always publicly covered. In fact, very seldom is. Other out-of-pocket costs. Oh, Before we talk about that, I'd like you to hear what women said in their own words. So one woman said, I had no money, and as a single parent, I had to pay for medication that cost $750 a month. This might have kept the cancer at bay. My work insurance refused to pay up front, and the pharmaceutical company refused to provide samples until I had gathered the money. I decided to go for radiation instead. Ironically, my cancer recurred in 2007 with marked involvement at the radiation site with multiple radiation-induced nodules. So this shows that because of uh, the treatment being too expensive, a woman had to choose a less than optimal treatment option, which resulted in problems down the road. I do want to say that some of the quotes that we're presenting you with today to tell the human story behind the uh, figures are taken from the report. And if you 
have a chance to read the report. There are a lot more personal stories in there. We've just taken a small selection. Here's another um, woman's experience. There's a program with the Ontario government to provide women being treated with medications for $2 a prescription for most routine medications. However, it does not cover some expensive medications, including the one which supports white blood count during chemotherapy. This medication costs close to $3,000 for each round of chemo. My interest would be for the provincial government to cover this drug for all women. There's an equity issue here because there's certainly an equity issue. Some women have private insurance, which would have covered the cost. Many others don't. So those with private insurance are definitely better off. In one woman's words, I had insurance, private insurance, so for the year and a bit that I was off, off work, I received full salary for six months and then two-thirds for the remaining time. We also spent $40,000 out of pocket for some of the drugs, and we were lucky that our insurance plan agreed to pick that up. What about some of the other out-of-pocket costs? Well, a lot of people have to travel for treatment, especially rural women, and about 30% of the people who responded to the survey were living in rural areas, and this was a big cost for them. Most people mention the cost of parking because of having to frequently go to the hospital for treatment uh, or to the doctors, and parking costs really added up. Child care was another uh, cost that was mentioned very often because often people had to either get child care while they were going for a medical appointment or they were too sick to take care of their children and had to hire someone else to do it. So how much income did people lose? because of uh, their breast cancer diagnosis. On average, total household income dropped by about $12,000 following the diagnosis. That's, that, in these figures, if the mean household income, that would be all earners in the household, is about $122,000, they're losing about 10% of annual uh, household income. And many women reported that it took years to work themselves back up to where they had been before the diagnosis and treatment. So with all these expenses, how did people cover their costs? Well, many people dipped into their savings, their RSPs. A lot of people went into debt. Some who were eligible were able to collect employment insurance sickness benefits. A lot of people asked for help from their husband, their spouse, or their family and friends. And some just had to go back to work in spite of feeling sick. They felt they just had no choice. Here were some other ways people covered the expenses. Um, sick leave, using sick leave, if people had it, and long-term disability were two, the two top um, bars on that graph. Uh, and sick leave is great and long-term disability are great if you happen to be employed and have some uh, time accumulated that allows you to do that. People who are self-employed or homemakers or part-time workers, for example, couldn't necessarily rely on those uh, sources of income. So how do people replace lost income? Um, a lot of people relied on employment insurance. That gives you 15 weeks maximum at 55% of your salary for those who are eligible, and it pays up to a maximum of $447 a week. Um, but if you don't have enough hours worked to qualify for EI, you're out of luck. Uh, and as we said before, treatment for the women surveyed lasted an average of 38 weeks. You can get up to a maximum of 15 weeks on EI. That leaves an income gap of 23 weeks when you're undergoing treatment with potentially no other source of income. So how long did people take off? Almost, most of the respondents, 70%, had to take off more than 16 weeks. So you can see that probably most people were experiencing some kind of an income gap there. And women told us about what that was like. Um, one woman's words, the EI system is woefully inadequate if you have to depend on it for support. 
15 weeks of benefits barely gets you through your surgeries and maybe one or two chemo treatments. And a second woman had said, EI staff told me I should go back to work when I felt that I couldn't. They gave me some suggestions that were very unreasonable with long wait lists for these jobs. Maybe they should make a house call or interview the patients and see for themselves what you are able to do and not do. Then they can make better observations and decisions for individual cases. And those who had private insurance, of course, as we said before, with out-of-pocket costs were better off. And those who had private long-term disability insurance also found that helpful. One woman who had insurance said, I'm grateful to be alive still, and I'm glad to have long-term disability insurance, unlike many of my peers who have been evicted from their homes due to lack of insurance. And that's peers, meaning other women who've been living with breast cancer and have had to go into debt and so on to uh, cover the costs and have lost their homes. Another woman said, I was fortunate to have disability insurance, which covered 70% of my salary during my period of leave and during my gradual return to work period. But those who don't have uh, salary insurance, of course, are worse off. In one woman's words, I had no salary insurance at my job because I work on annual contracts. I didn't have long-term sick leave or disability insurance either. After I used up all my sick leave and vacation time, I had to go on un unemployment insurance, and that's why I had to go, to back work, go back to work early. And so many women said they had to go, to back, go back to work early because they ran out of money. So what was it like to use up savings? Here's one woman's uh, story. It took 10 months during the meltdown of my RSPs. I've been set back many years from retirement and no longer have the stamina to work full time. Another woman says, I have savings, of course. I will use them all. What happens when I do not have savings anymore? This is sad and scary for me and I feel very alone. Another woman, I'm now 64 and I've been laid off from my job. I'm still trying to repay the debts I acquired while going through treatments. My retirement savings are all but gone. And another woman said, I had to go on welfare. Some of these people were people that had jobs and may have been able to go back to them. But what about women who are self-employed? About 8% of the people who responded to the survey were self-employed. And at the time of the survey, people who were self-employed were not eligible for employment insurance benefits. And this is what they said. I had to sell the business to relieve stress and also to have some income to live on for the next six months of treatment. And another woman said, dealing with breast cancer while being self-employed, working only from contracts, has been a very difficult situation for me. I had only a very small amount of payments from insurance, and so I have been under constant stress about finances since the beginning. I have to say, uh, following the time that the survey was done, we do have some good news in the sense that because of the EI um, changes to the EI insurance, now self-employed people are eligible. They can opt in and uh, receive the EI uh, coverage. So that's a bit of good news. What about going back to work and having a job to go back to or not? Before uh, their diagnosis, 80%, 81% of the women uh, in the survey had full-time jobs. But after their treatment, only 64% had a job, either full or part-time. So it had a big impact on employment. As you can see from this graph, there were fewer people who were employed full or part-time and more are unemployed. Uh, some decided to retire or they're on more or less permanent uh, disability. So this is what some women said about uh, what happened when they wanted to go back to work. They laid me off after 18 years of employment. One woman said, making the decision to retire because of all my issues was sad and disappointing as I no longer enjoyed the career I had loved to work in for so long. And here's a woman who has been looking for jobs, and this is what she encountered. 
I try to hide the fact that I was treated for cancer because when it's found out, I don't get jobs I apply for. And the company physical exams I, I dread because the scar from the surgery is visible. I've considered lying, but that's fraud. I feel like some kind of criminal. And what the survey showed is that almost 20% uh, of people were forced to quit their job because of their breast cancer diagnosis. And uh, many had to leave their jobs or just had no job to go back to for a variety of reasons. And women talk about it. Some women talked about going back to work. And uh, one woman saw this as a very positive mood. She said, uh, it was my choice to return to work. I wanted a normal life back, not focusing on breast cancer. Another woman talks about how she had to go back to work earlier than she was ready to. She says, I was not mentally ready to go back to work, but I had to as my employment insurance ran out after 15 weeks, and I needed the money to take care of my family. Another woman said, I knew I couldn't have paid my mortgage bill or my bills on long-term disability wages. I had no choice but to go back to work. I would have liked to take more time after treatment to rest and recover, but that wasn't an option. So what barriers do women face and challenges when they go back to work? Well, fatigue, as you can see in the top bar of that graph, is is way ahead as the leader in terms of barriers to returning to work and uh, staying at work after you're returned. It was mentioned by uh, almost a third of the people in the survey. Uh, other things that came out as being important were the attitudes of coworkers and employers, as we'll hear a little bit later. Again, all these graphs are in the report if you want to study them in more detail. Here are some more um, testimonies from women. Treatments take their toll on the body and mind, and it's difficult to come up with the energy and the mental alertness to give a new job what it requires. Another woman says, my work is very physical work, and my level of endurance due to fatigue and joint pains is not back to normal. After two sets of chemotherapy, I could not retain the information as I had in the job over the past 10 years, and I was feeling very incompetent. Chemo brain is one of those side effects that no one really talks about, and so you keep it to yourself and don't discuss it. And if you go to the report, you'll see a lot more accounts of the effect of chemo brain on going back to work. In one of the earlier slides, we noted that the attitudes of employers and coworkers were very important in women going back to work, and here's what they said about that. One woman was lucky. She said, I was welcomed back with hugs, flowers, cheers, and compliments on how well I looked. This was a great morale booster since my hair was still sparse and short, and my eyelashes were nearly non-existent. Another woman says, my colleagues and supervisor did not demand more than I could give. The most senior person in my immediate work group was friendly and casual about my return, which set the tone for everyone else. Another woman's experience, there was unspoken pressure exerted by supervisors and colleagues. Their unkind remarks made me feel guilty about not being up to speed and giving 100% of the level I had before my diagnosis. Another woman states, employers are afraid you are a drain on health care and benefits. Okay, so in terms of get, going back to work, what is helpful? What can employers do to help women return to work? Well, one of the top uh, things that emerged from the survey is that being able to go to, back to work gradually is a tremendous help. Uh, either going back part-time or with reduced hours or a few days a week building up as your strength returns. 20% of the people in the survey reported that a gradual return to work made the transition back to the job much easier. As one woman said, I actually had a very flexible arrangement with my supervisor. When I felt able to work, I was able to. When I felt fatigued, I was free to return home. As my energy levels improved, I was able to increase the number of hours and days I was able to work. And she really speaks for many women. Uh, we had a lot of 
women saying very similar things. And then accommodations in the workplace were also a tremendous help. As one woman said, I'm one of the lucky ones because we have a rehabilitation officer at work. And another woman said, my workstation was changed to one that was more ergonomically correct. And there she was referring to uh, her computer, uh, her chair, that kind of lighting, that kind of thing. Uh, and then another woman said something that a lot of uh, other women talked about in terms of lymphedema. It turned out that some things did flare up my lymphedema. I was then placed in an area where I didn't use the affected arm as much. And several women in their testimonies talked about lymphedema and how uh, they, had, they were able to have, if they were lucky, some rehab and an ergonomic assessment at work that uh, tried to work around those problems. So, work uh, or breast cancer diagnosis has more than a financial impact. It also has health and emotional impact. And as you can see here, stress and anxiety uh, caused by the financial burden, these are all things coming from the financial burden, um, was, a, was a very important uh, factor for people. A lot of people suffered from insomnia as a result of worrying about money. Uh, many people, as we heard earlier, returned back to work before they felt ready. Um, and didn't feel well enough when they were at work. And about a third of the women in the survey believe that the financial impact will have a long-term negative effect on their health. And this is dealt with in more details in the report if you'd like more, more information on that. Not only the woman herself and her workplace was affected, but the breast cancer diagnosis and the financial costs had an impact on close relationships. They had financial, the impact was both financial and emotional. In terms of the financial impact, more than half of the uh, people in the survey had at least one dependent living at home when they were undergoing treatment, so that was a financial uh, responsibility. And the most frequently mentioned effects on their families were the, the burden of having to cut back worry, having to reduce spending, having to borrow money, taking on more work to make, make up the financial gap, uh, often by the spouse, and having less money for their children's education or other needs. As one woman said, there was a huge financial burden on my husband, so I felt very guilty that he had to take on extra work because I couldn't work. Another woman said, we couldn't afford to have my husband take any time off to be with me. And another woman, my son keeps asking me when I'm returning to work due to our tight budget. And you can imagine the kind of stress that she li was living under because of that. The, emotional bur the financial burden also has an emotional impact on relationships. As one woman said, having breast cancer put an additional strain on our already strained marriage and we are now separated. Having money problems didn't help. And another woman said, my family help out more since I returned to work. Women usually do most of the housework and that had to change. My husband and two kids stepped up to the plate. So we can see from that last example that, um, that it had a positive change probably on relationships in the household. Uh, we also discovered too that family members took a lot of time off work to be with people to go to their appointments or to provide care when women were uh, just feeling uh, sick at home. And that affected um, relationships as well. One thing that emerged really strongly from the research was the, the very strong financial uh, and emotional impact of chemotherapy, more so than radiation or surgery. So we call that the chemo effect. People or women who underwent chemotherapy have suffered the greatest decline in household income. They had to take more time off work than people with other kinds of treatments. More of them had to quit their jobs. Uh, a lot of them, of course, suffered from chemo brain on their return to work. Uh, their families had to take more time off to be with them. 
And the women who underwent chemo had a greater perception that the financial burden will have a negative long-term impact on their health. So that emerged in many different places in the survey, and um, it's something that we flagged as probably worthy of uh, further research. So we've had an overview now of how expensive, uh, in terms of out-of-pocket costs, uh, breast cancer treatment can be, the impact on returning to work, um, the impact on families as well. And people and their women and their families who live with breast cancer are aware of this, or many are, but how aware are Canadians about these issues? So the, the public opinion poll uh, revealed these findings. About 81% of Canadians surveyed, this is over 3,000 Canadians, and it's at that level of participation, these can be applied to the broad Canadian population. So we can say with confidence that about 81% of Canadians believe that a breast cancer diagnosis carries a heavy financial burden on the patient and family. So there is a high level of awareness. On the other hand, people, uh, Canadians underestimate the rate of return to work. In other words, how many women are able to go back to work. People tend to estimate that um, most women do return uh, to work with no problems. As we know, that's not the case. But very few uh, Canadians believe that patients exper experience major difficulties in returning to work. Most believe that the survivors are able to work the same number of hours as before diagnosis. And as the survey showed, that's most often not the case. But most Canadians strongly support extending employment insurance sickness benefits beyond their present levels. And this is a little more information on that. Uh, of those who supported increasing EI sickness benefits, uh, most support going beyond 30 weeks, uh, and the mean uh, suggested was about 42, 43 weeks. So uh, there is very strong public support for extending the length of sickness benefits. So given all this information, what did CBCN, the Canadian Breast Cancer Network, uh, how did they respond to this? Uh, we asked uh, women in the survey what their ideas were about what could be done, and we got many suggestions for governments, including extending EI, and for insurance providers who provide long-term disability uh, and drug coverage, that those uh, benefits could be enhanced, or even that insurance providers could be a little more compassionate and sympathetic. A lot of responses uh, suggesting what employers could do to help women gradually return to work, and even uh, what coworkers could do in terms of just having their awareness raised about what it's like to go through treatment and what it's like to come back to work not feeling 100%. So CBN, CBCN has responded by developing an action plan. And these are the main elements of it. There's, there are more details in the report itself. CBCN is actively working right now on creating a national task force on the financial impact of breast cancer and other health conditions because what these results show us and what conversations with a lot of other cancer groups have shown is that what's experienced by women with breast cancer and their families is not necessarily unique to breast cancer. A lot of these challenges are faced by people living with other cancers as well. Uh, the next item in the action plan is looking, uh, dialoguing with government about extending EI sickness benefits. Also, uh, continuing to advocate for a national pharmacare plan and for greater coverage for drugs and supplies, which includes prosthetics, um, all across Canada, and for an equitable coverage. As we noted before, your coverage varies very much depending on which part of Canada you live in. Also, um, the need for lymphedema therapy came up. Uh, not only more therapy, but also greater access to more and uh, better prosthetics, and also for more accommodations for lymphedema in the workplace. Uh, looking at the impact of chemotherapies, we noted it has a disproportionate impact on, on uh, women and their families. 
um, also raising awareness, just raising, raising awareness of people about these issues, about how much a diagnosis can cost um, patients and their families and what can be done about it. Uh, another item is dialogue with the insurance industry about things like enhancing benefits and so on. Uh, engaging employers, human, re human relations, human resources rather, specialists, unions and professional associations. Quite a few times women said in their comments that their union or their, their professional association had been very helpful in standing up for them and their rights. Um, small businesses emerged as an important area of interest because large corporations tend to have pretty good private insurance plans and good benefits. Small businesses, which are one of the backbones of the Canadian economy, often uh, don't have very uh, extensive benefits either because they can't afford them or because they don't have a large enough employee pool to make it affordable. And so CBCN wants to dialogue with small businesses as well as large corporations about how, for example, small businesses might work together in groups to uh, be able to create affordable uh, group insurance plans. Uh, and lastly, working with partners, other disease groups, other cancers, other chronic disease groups, and uh, health care providers, doctors, nurses, you know, have an interest in, in these issues and uh, researchers. There are a lot of areas uh, that could benefit from further research. And uh, we can already tell you that CPCN is taking a very concrete step to help women and their families. They're developing a breast cancer survivor financial guide, a fi financial planning and resource, resource guide entitled The Breast Cancer Survivor to Financial Survivor Project. And that guide will be released uh, and launched by CBCN early in 2011, next year. So uh, just to wrap up, we've had a good overview, I hope, um, of the financial impact and the challenges of returning to work and some ideas for what could be done to meet those challenges. So I would just say in conclusion that breast cancer is an economic condition as well as a health condition and that the, a diagnosis of breast cancer should be the beginning of a healing journey and not, as it is for many women and their families, a descent into poverty and despair. So I want to thank you for participating in the webinar and uh, throw it over to Jen now for questions and uh, comments. Thanks so much, Janet. That was, a, that was an excellent overview and summary of the report. For those of you who don't have a copy of the report and would like a hard copy, you can email me. It's jmcneil at cbcn.ca or just reply to the invitation that you were sent to this webinar um, and we can send out hard copies to you. It's also available on our website and I will send out a link to the soft copy of the report uh, later this afternoon for everyone. It can be found on the cbcn.ca website. There are a couple questions that have come in. I would encourage anyone who has additional questions to please submit them now and uh, Janet will be able to hopefully answer them for you. Janet, we have a couple that I'm going to let you uh, respond to. The first one was, how were the potential respondents identified and what was the percentage that did respond? I'm not sure if you have the actual percentage number with you right now. Well, I can say a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say that the economic impact report is available in French and English. Thank you. So it's available in both languages uh, on the website and also in hard copy. In terms of the uh, question, the um, potential respondents were identified and by uh, CBCN sending out invitations to its uh, member groups and uh, partners. Now, Jen, you might uh, know more about that. I wasn't involved in that stage of the research. Mm -hmm. There's about uh, 3,500 members and member groups and partners that CBCN works with. Um, and then in turn, a lot of the member groups would have passed out that survey and that information to uh, their members as well. So I don't offhand have the actual number of participants that did respond based on that or sorry, the, the percentage rather. We did have 446 people respond, as Janet had outlined earlier. Um, so based on, there was at least 3,500 sent out through our network and then 
I'm assuming exponentially more through other networks. Mm -hmm. So whatever percentage 446 is of 3,500, and I'm not sure, but it's uh, it's well over 10%. It's really hard <laughs> to say, I think, because of the um, snowball effect of sending out um, a call for participation through various networks. Yeah. It's hard to say how many uh, women would have... Uh, and man too would have read that invitation. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's the best we can do in terms of the answer to that question. The second question um, pertains to self-employed women. Did we do any research regarding self-employed women? Janet, will you do you want to touch on that a little bit? There um, were. Yes, as I mentioned earlier, about eight percent of the women who responded to the survey were self-employed. And if you read the, the report actually has much more information on the situation of self-employment than we were able to include in this uh, webinar. Uh, but generally what women said was, first of all, they were not eligible for EI, uh, sickness benefits, so that was um, a problem. Many of them did not necessarily have um, generous long-term disability and drug coverage plans because they would have had to buy these plans themselves. So that can a really good personal package can cost five to six thousand dollars a year. I know because I'm self employed. So uh it's a fair expense for people who are self employed, especially those who have small businesses. Um, now as I say, uh women can who are self employed can opt in. But many of the women who are self employed talked about the fact that they had to either sell their business, they lost clients. Some of them said they were lucky. Their clients were understanding and waited for them uh, to finish their treatment, uh, to pick up the contracts again. In many cases, they didn't. In some cases, women said they lost maybe about half of their business and had to really build, back, build it back up. So uh, there was a long recovery period because of that. Okay. Thanks, Janet. Yeah. Um, the next question is, uh, what role do you see patient advocates possibly taking on when people are needing help dealing with their employers? Okay, well, I, I could see, and I think CBCN could respond to, I'm responding as myself, you know, having to having read all this material. Um, I think um, advocates can play, at an individual role, uh, level, certainly, um, Advocates could perhaps, you know, help women talk to their employers. In terms of a larger level, um, I would see advocacy uh, taking place with um, groups of corporations, for example, the Canadian Chambers of Commerce, uh, the Canadian um, Federation of Small Business. I think they've changed their name recently, but there is an, a Canadian Association of Small Businesses that could certainly... Um, uh, be engaged with in terms of raising awareness and, and advocacy um, at, a, at a more global level. Um, and I'm not sure whether the question deals with a sort of a very personal um, intervention, in other words, you know, going with somebody to talk to their employer, or if you're referring to more um, system level uh, advocacy working with large, uh, say, employer groups. And that is something that CBCN is looking um, to do as well, is help, helping working with larger employer groups. From the sort of patient advocate uh, perspective, uh, I think that some, there are a lot of patients who are now advocates because they've had to advocate for themselves and who would be able to work with, let's say, another patient who is, or another woman who's returning to work um, and who needs to go in and speak with her employer. We're working, CBCN is working on uh, developing an adopt a writing campaign and having survivor advocates in every writing across Canada. So that's something that we could possibly bring up with the members of that campaign who are already involved from a survivorship level um, on advocating, not just with their government officials, but on how to do that as well with employers. So that's something I'll definitely take note of um, and bring back to the directors at CBCN. And I, I think, think another thing, too, in terms of the peer support groups that are out there across the country, uh, I'm not sure how many of them would have the facilities to provide peer support at that level for mm -hmm. a woman who's going back to work, but that's another possibility. 
I think, too, one thing that was mentioned in the survey, too, was that unions and professional associations were uh, good at advocating for people with their employers. And it's possible that patient advocate groups might want to connect with uh, professional associations and unions, and also with human resources associations, too, of um, talking to human resources professionals through their associations to raise awareness. Um, because they're often the people inside a company or a corporation that's going to be making decisions involving women coming back to work. That's a great idea. I think that's very helpful. We'll move along to the next question. Uh, to your knowledge, do most insurance companies recognize chemo brain as a legitimate reason for extension of disability benefits? Janet, do you know, do you have any information on that? I don't, I don't have precise information, but what I would gather from the thousands of um, comments that women made in this survey was that it's not recognized, really, um, as a specific condition. Um, it might lead to something, you know, I mean, you might be able to associate it with something like fatigue or, uh, but uh, I don't think chemo brain, I think actually the research in the recent literature is starting to identify that as an identifiable condition. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that's worked its way from the research into, say, human resources practices. I, I would say probably not, but that may vary from one company to another. But I would say that because it's appearing more and more in the literature and it's being identified as um, a specific condition, that probably um, eventually that will happen. Yeah, I don't. That's the extent of my knowledge, but I can't say that I'm an expert on that. No, and I don't have the information on that either. I don't think, just from what I've heard, um, I'd have to agree with you. I don't think it's there yet, but as more information comes out on it, they're going to have to address the issue, I think. Yeah, and I, I, a lot of the comments from women focused on things like the insurance company keeps calling me and insisting that I go back to work and I have to keep saying that I can't, you know, and in some cases, it might have been fatigue or pain. In a lot of cases, it might have been something like chemo brain. And a lot of women talked about how uh, difficult it was to be able to focus and concentrate and how some of them were doing crossword puzzles and so on to bring their mental um, sharpness back up. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's definitely a big concern, uh, and it's definitely out there yeah, as a concern at this point. Yeah. Absolutely. So another question um, from Barbara at the Ottawa Hospital says, I believe you stated that many women reported that it took them years to achieve the level of employment that they had pre-diagnosis. Do you have any idea what the reasons were for this? I, well, I think in, in many cases, as I recall, the accounts that women gave were because while they were away, for example, their job might have been reclassified um, to a lower level. Uh, in some cases, women said they came back to work and they were expected to uh, kind of prove themselves all over again. And uh, they were either downgraded into a lower position or because of reorganization in the company while they were off, they had to come back into a lower level uh, position. Um, often they, they might have had to switch to part-time work instead of full-time, which would, would have set them back career-wise in terms of working back up to the level they were. Those are some of the reasons that I remember, and there are probably more that were uh, described in the report itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll move along to another question. Uh, this one's by Melanie. and She says, a big issue continues to be how do we get this information and support into the hands of the breast cancer patients? Well, I would suggest that those who are aware of it might um, be able to point people to the report, which is up on the web. I think in general, you know, the thing that surprised me was how shocked people were when they found out that an awful lot of costs the patient is expected to pick up themselves. Uh, I think a lot of people before they get a diagnosis think Medicare pays for everything. And that's not the case. And I think even just raising awareness about that mm -hmm. would be a big step forward. And then uh, most people don't confront these things until they have to, you know, and, and I don't blame them. But I think just realizing that things like out-of-hospital uh, out drugs uh, have to be covered by people, often medical supplies, prosthetics, a lot of the cost of that is out-of-pocket, and um, home care. 
and things like child care, you know, the kind of hidden expenses that people don't think about. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think just raising people's awareness that, you know, you're likely to be presented with a pretty big tab uh, in spite of the fact that we do have um, Medicare in this country. It doesn't cover an awful lot of expenses. Yeah, agreed. Uh, and then and then in terms of just the general awareness question, you know, there I would just say that people that are working in um, – Groups that uh, deal with patient peer support, um, large organizations like the cancer um, societies, the cancer organizations, the specific cancer organizations, I think, need to be getting that uh, information out. Um, the other thing, too, is that uh, one suggestion I think came out, uh, brown bag lunches. You know, I mean, going to uh, large corporations, having brown bag lunches and just raising awareness. I mean, there are all kinds of ways that awareness can be uh, raised, you know, mm-hmm. seeking to get stories into the media, that kind of thing. I, I do want to mention one other thing. The, the previous question about how do women work themselves back up to where they were before the diagnosis, Right. a lot of men sh- women did mention that they lost pension benefits. Because they were off work and off salary, they weren't contributing to the pension plan and they weren't getting the matching contribution from their employer that would have been normally coming to them during that period. So uh, several women mentioned in their comments that they were set way back in terms of their pension as a result of that and then would have to think about working more years or uh, living on a reduced income way below what they had expected to be able to live on when they retire. That's an excellent point. Um, another question that came in, it's back around the percentage of women that uh, responded to the survey, and the question is, how sure are we that the results are representative if only a minority of women responded? There was, I'm just trying to do the math here, based on the actual poll and the survey, um, it was about on par with what you need for a survey to be considered uh, relevant and accurate. So that was something that was that was uh, checked throughout the process to make sure that the the actual numbers and survey input and results that we had were able to be considered valid um, based on the number of people that were that the poll went out to. So it did fall in line with the guidelines for that and for research. Yeah, and I would think Polara, which was the large survey firm that uh, did the uh, survey. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they provided uh, guarantees in terms of the sample size being large enough to be um, applicable to a larger population. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, as I mentioned before, um, anyone wishing to receive a copy of the report can request it from myself, and I will send out the link for the electronic copy, so please share this with your colleagues or patients, um, anyone who may benefit from this information. Janet, thank you so much for presenting this information. Thank you for all the work that you've done on putting this report together. It's really beneficial. It's a great tool that uh, we'll be able to use moving forward. So thank you for taking the time to uh, share this information with us. My pleasure. Thanks, Jen. And just briefly, for everyone who's attended, thank you for attending. I have just pushed a survey to your screen. You'll see it pop up in a separate pop-up window. It should just take you a minute or two to complete the survey. If you could give us your feedback, input. We're working on a couple webinars a month, so any information that you would like to see in future webinars, your thoughts on this webinar, what we can do to provide better information, what we're doing right, please take a moment and fill that out and let us know. Again, thank you so much, Janet, and we'll see everyone at the next webinar. Take care. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes this webcast.